Episode 67, The Treasure of the Sierra Madre by B. Trapp. And welcome back to the show, Point Blank listeners. Uh, my name is Kurt, and joining me once again, here's Justin. Hey, Kurt. Hey, listeners. How, how's it going? How's tricks? Well, it's going uh, pretty good here, Justin. I'm excited to be back here on the mic with you. Um, I do feel like I need to apologize to our listeners. It has been a while. Uh, it's mostly my fault. Other things in life getting in the way of recording this podcast. But we're back. Uh, we've got a plan for the next couple of episodes, which I think Justin and I are, are pretty excited about. And uh, today we're going to talk about maybe a book that, I don't know, for some people isn't going to fit into the category of this show, but uh, I think it does. We'll get around to that. That's The Treasure of the Sierra Madre uh, by one of my favorite authors of all time, B. Travin. So, uh, Justin, um, you know, are you excited to talk about this one today? Yes, I am. It's a book that I had not read in the past. Of course, long ago I saw the film. And for our next episode, we're going to do a mini episode where we compare the book and the film, but I haven't seen it in a while. And so I came to the book relatively fresh. I've never read uh, in full a a B. Travin novel. I have Death Ship on my stack of books, and I attempted to read one of his, uh, his Mexico books about the revolution. I think it was government, and I just couldn't get into it. So I went in thinking, I'm not sure if I'm going to like this or love it or have mixed feelings or what. And and as you'll see in my my review, I, I you know I, I overall in, enjoyed the experience, uh, and I think there's a lot of uh, a lot we can talk about in this book. But you know, your the question you or, or the question you raise, I guess, about whether or not it's crime fiction or, or whether or not it fits within uh, this podcast's general purview. That it, that's a fair question to ask, and I think we'll probably spend some time talking about that. I am using the the benefit of being one of the co-hosts of this show to talk about one of my favorite authors, but that's fine. Um, you know, I really have to say, I, you know, this is not my first time reading the book. I think this is my third time, but it is my first time reading it since we've started this show and really analyzed crime fiction. And I think more importantly, a lot of fiction that comes out around the same time period uh, as this book and is directed towards a similar uh, group of readers is is something I would definitely say about it. Now, The Death Ship is ultimately like my favorite B. Draven novel. Like it's one of my favorite books of all time. And maybe we'll touch on that a little bit later. But I will say that right up front, if you want a if you want to read what I think is the best work that Travin uh, has to offer, it's The Death Ship. The Jungle Novels, uh, which government that you mentioned is a part of it, um, that's a little bit more of a challenge. I haven't read all of those yet. but So my, my core question before you get into the, the summary of this, Justin, is, and I'm looking kind of for a yes or no or maybe a one-sentence answer here is, I think we could probably say that this isn't necessarily, it's certainly not detective fiction. Maybe you could, you know, it's probably not necessarily crime fiction, but could you or would you be willing to put this under the umbrella of noir fiction? I would say at times it has noir elements or moments, but what I would really call it in terms of what we do on this podcast is hard boiled. I think there's hard boiled qualities to this book that thread from start to finish uh, whereas I feel like the noir moments are interspersed but not consistent, that would be my complex sentence answer. Interesting. I, I like that, and I think we'll let's explore that later in the show after we've we've got a little bit more to work with. But, sure, um, sure. That's I'm 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 very interested in your answer. Cool. Um, would you like to to dive right into a summary of the Treasure of the Sierra Madre? Yeah, this is a this is an interesting book. It. it it's fairly simple, but but when you try to write up a, a review of it or a synopsis, you realize how many parts there are and how many stories inside of stories, and it was sort of complicated to try to make sure I could fit it all into this uh, brief review. But um, So it'll go a little long, but I'll do my best. This was my first time reading Butravin in, in Treasure of the Sierra Madre. It's not exactly what I expected, uh, but that's usually a good thing. I call this an adventure novel with noir moments, uh, and it was published in 1933 in the U.S. in 1927 in Germany. Uh, I think the dates are interesting because some people refer to this as being a Depression-era fiction book 
because of its, you know, conversation uh, and motifs about greed and capitalism and wealth and, and how human nature and greed, you know, affect the psyche and, and ruin, ruin humans, all that kind of stuff. Well, this happened before the Depression, so he wasn't commenting on it uh, explicitly. Nonetheless, uh, this came out in 33. This is in the golden era of hard-boiled detective fiction, so he was operating in the same space as Dash Hammett and others. So just point of, point of note. So uh, Treasure of the Sierra Madre tells the story of an American worker named Dobbs. He's, that's his only name. And he arrives to Mexico and he's, he's there to seek his fortune in oil. He's there to get a job as, as a, as a uh, roughneck and, and make some quick dough, so to speak. Uh, he's down and out at the beginning of the story in a supply town. Uh, he's, he's making men, ends meet by panhandling and crashing in these like incredibly like challenging flop houses. He lives outdoors and in a shack with a bunch of bugs inside of it. It captures this sort of depression era uh, setting, this sort of squalor and desperation, which does sort of set the tone for for the story and maybe some of the noir components. It's in this capacity uh, that, that Dobbs runs into another American named Curtin, and together they uh, work together to try to score oil jobs. Uh, but they find out that the oil industry has taken a turn. Uh, there's a lot of dudes coming back from the oil derricks empty-handed. Uh, the jobs are, are running dry, so to speak, and, and they're out of luck. So what are they going to do? Uh, back in town, they run into this old man who's telling stories about his days as a gold miner. His name is Howard. And Dobbs is captivated. He's, he's listening to these stories, and he gets sort of seduced by them. It's after uh, the story that Dobbs and, and Howard end up talking, and and Dobbs suggests that they uh, join forces. And and you know he's game. He, he he wants to go search for gold. He wants to go try his hand at this this fortune. And uh, you know fast forward, the three men agree that they're going to join forces, uh, dig up, uh, you know, secure the supplies they need, and and uh, set off on an adventure into the mountains. So the first third of this book, because this book starts slow, uh, if you're expecting a modern crime fiction tale, um, you're going to be waiting for a while uh, for any real action to happen. Uh, the first one third of the book really does a, a good job of painting a picture of Mexico as a landscape to be plundered. Uh, it shows these dudes scheming to get a paycheck or to get rich, depending on uh, the person. Uh, in these industries that are ephemeral and, and backbreaking, so you get a lot of this social realist, uh, you know, exploration of of the situation in Mexico at the time. Um, it's also a detailed photograph of life in Mexico in the 1930s. B. Traven brings a lot, I'm guessing, of his personal experience uh, living in Mexico to this to this story, um, and and is a lot of his socioeconomic commentary. So the dudes get together, they, they wrangle supplies and, and donkeys, and they head up into the mountains, way out of uh, the realm of civilization. And, and they learn how to live with each other. They each have their own idiosyncrasies. Dobbs is pretty much a basic, selfish asshole type. Uh, he's hard-nosed, he, he talks playing, he gets irritated easily. I, w- I wouldn't want to hang out with him for long. I der- certainly wouldn't want to get drunk with him. Howard is more like the wise old owl. He's been there. He's done that. He has a lot of experience. He might be a little loony, but I think he has a good heart. And um, and he, that's sort of his role uh, in terms of the trio. And then uh, the other guy, Curtin, he is um, he's more like a, I don't know, a peacekeeper. He's he's decent. He's he's not as assholeish as Dobbs. Um, but together they work hard for many months. We see them out there deciding where to where to mine. You know, they they trust Howard to find the location because he has like the nose for for gold dust or or mining conditions. He's like the geologist, and and they um, they uh, tell the local indigenous people that they're up there hunting so that nobody will uh, make assumptions about their their activity because they don't want to be found out. They don't want somebody from one of the big industries to start snooping around and. and and sniff out their gold mine and exploit it or usurp it or whatnot. So they're up there, they find a mine, they start to uh, get a little bit of yield, and they're collecting gold dust in bags. And, you know, the question then begins, how much is enough? When do you draw the line? I mean, it's just money. It's money and potential profit. So at what point are you satisfied and willing to go back feeling that you've done uh, enough for yourself and your future? So this is the first half of the book. And then we get a little bit of intrigue. A fourth member, a fourth person arrives to the camp. 
And he arrives because he was he spotted, I believe, Curtin down in the indigenous village and started to snoop around and get a sense maybe Curtin isn't really hunting. Maybe Curtin's up to some something else. So this fourth person arrives to the camp and this is this does not go over well. Uh, the guys are are pretty wary, pretty sketched out, uh, and pretty um, aggressive uh, against this guy. He goes by the name of Lacaud or, or something along those lines. It might be French. And this guy, you know, they kick him out, but he refuses to leave. He's like a burr. He's just stuck to them. You know, Dobbs tries to f- pretty much fight him. They, they have no interest in this dude, but he's persistent. He keeps seeing through their facade. He explains why he doesn't think they're hunters. He knows that they're after gold, and he sort of sets them up to understand that he knows what he's doing. He has an interest in pursuing his own mine. He doesn't have to work with them exactly, but he does want to sort of hang out in the same camp. So rather than settle this through dialogue, uh, what Traven does is he in, he invites another plot element into the story that sort of brings them together. Uh, there's this this group of bandits that have been wandering around the countryside, raiding trains and, and, and upsetting villages and whatnot. So they spot these bandits uh, uh, sort of coming toward the mountain. And this forces the four men to unite and work together uh, in essentially trench warfare to fend off the bandits from from uh, taking over their mine site or, or killing the guys. After this, they, they let Lacan sort of hang out, uh, though he's still going to be working on his own mine. What I like about this situation is that it adds another layer of tension, this invitation of Lacaud to the story. Uh, on top of that, you get this adventure element of, of these bandits coming, which really doesn't, it's not, it's not that essential to the plot, uh, but it creates for that, just that, that adventure excitement into the middle of a story. Uh, if the bandits weren't there and they didn't have a shootout, it would really just be a bunch, a bunch of ordinary guys arguing for 300 pages uh, as they mine, which might be a little too close to real life to be enjoyable. I want to pause here and say we're deep in the story at this point, and I haven't mentioned that there are actually three stories inside of this story that are important to talk about because they reveal aspects of the story and they foreshadow things to come. Uh, the first one is is the story I already mentioned about Howard talking about the Agua Verde mine and, and the riches of the gold mine. It's a little bit of a cautionary tale. And this is the story that Hobbes overheard, after which he invited Howard to, uh, to work with him. But this story sort of sets up the, the dangers of gold mining, the, the fact that greed will get you. Greed, the greed makes you crazy and, and how it, it happens to most everybody who pursues gold mining. So that's the first story inside a story. The second one is Lacaud's story. Once they see the bandits coming... They still have a, a couple hours before they arrive, and he and he knows who the who these bandits are, and he tells a story about these bandits who robbed a train and murdered all the train goers, and and it's just this sort of devastating portrait of, of these bandits and their behavior, and this sets up the raid on the mining camp that they narrowly survive once the sort of military comes in and starts pursuing the bandits. It's a it's a pretty close call, and then the last story is the story that Howard tells after the guys have decided. The, three, the trio, they decide that they're going to wrap up their mining. They're, they're going to cut and run. They've, they have enough, and they're tired of dealing with Lacaud, and they're going to hit the road and try to make it back to the city. Uh, Howard tells a story about uh, this gold op- mining operation, or any gold op- mining operation, how they often end in ruin. Um, the message of the story being that gold mining might be hard, but it's even harder transporting the gold back to civilization. This is where the true test lies. Uh, this story obviously foreshadows the difficulty that these men are going to face on the road back. And you'll see that in the last third of the book, that trial, the trial and tribulations they face as, the, as, they, as they work their way back into town. The three guys wrap up, they, they close up their mine, and they carry their bags of gold on their, on their, on their donkeys back to the city. Uh, of course, it can't be that easy. We still have a good bit of the book to read. Uh, they are still not friends at this point, but they've tolerated each other for long enough that they are generally relieved to be getting out of the wilderness. And I start to feel the excitement for them and with them, sort of like how I feel after several days of camping in the wilderness. It's, 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 you start to imagine eating enchiladas and getting a cold beer, and that stuff gets exciting, and it it's, serves as fuel to get you back home. At one point, though, on the road back to the uh, to the city, Howard is summoned by uh, the leader of a local indigenous village, not the one that we were uh, experiencing throughout the story, but one later on on the road. 
an old man or maybe a chief of the village uh, comes to Howard and asks if he can heal his son. And Howard does this. He, it's not, I mean, this is a little bit of hocus pocus and it, I'm not sure how I feel about it, but they assumed that he had some kind of uh, white man knowledge that could help, help the son. And Howard sort of makes some shit up and, and, and it turns out that it works. Um, and so as reward, he's asked to stay in the village and be celebrated for his miracle act and, and to heal other people. So there's some commentary about healing and, and power and some racial stuff. Anyway, he sticks around, and that means they make an arrangement that Dobbs and Curtin are going to take his gold with them back to the city and put it in a, in a bank, and, and then they're going to meet up later. Of course, this opens the door for more talk of, of greed, more, more of the psychological battle that Dobbs is really struggling with. And, and eventually, uh, you know, he's the one that succumbs to it as opposed to the other two. So that they hop off uh, on the road and they head, head with their gold-laden donkeys back toward town. This is where Dobbs, one night, he just fully manifests his inner asshole. Uh, he has gold greed. He's thinking, well, you know, if we don't have to tell Howard about the gold, we can just you know, not put it in a bank. We can take off with it. He starts to get entertain all these thoughts of how he can hold on to all the money. Uh, but then he starts to menace Curtin. He starts to think, see Curtin as, as a threat because Curtin is siding with Howard. And then Dobbs gets paranoid and suspicious and starts accusing Curtin of, of, of being up to no good, essentially sort of transplanting his own bad thoughts in, onto Curtin. This is where Dobbs essentially snaps. And this is one of the most noirish scenes, I think, in the story. It's like a fire at night, and the men are sort of in this uh, psychological struggle. And Dobbs is a real monster at this point. Uh, and, and this is a great scene. I don't want to spoil it. I just want to leave it a little bit vague, but, but it's a pretty 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 rough moment for in the story and it's a it's a scene that i really enjoyed so later on dobbs is is on the road and he's he's beset by bandits these bandits uh, don't care much uh, for the bags of sand they see this guy and they see the donkeys and they and they don't understand anything about the gold they don't care about the gold because the gold is worthless unless you're able to sell it to somebody by itself it's just sand so these bandits actually think that dobbs is trying to swindle uh, some hide merchants because they see the sand is replacing actual genuine useful hides. Uh, he thought that he was, he was using the, the sand as a filler, as, as something to throw the weight off. So uh, ultimately, that interaction doesn't really go well for Dobbs, um, and, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, let's just say that Dobbs gets what he deserves, and the other protagonists have their own stories to tell at the end of the story. Uh, to conclude... I liked a lot of this book. I like how it captures the inner life of a man beset by greed and how this greed, greedy mindset lends itself to crime and criminality. I wouldn't call this a noir story per se, but a, a story with noir moments. This is largely a tale of adventure and a travel narrative of, of life in Mexico in the 1930s. Traven is an anarchist or, or is rumored to be an anarchist, and he no doubt threads all this socioeconomic commentary uh, throughout the story about haves and have-nots, bosses and workers, colonizers and colonized. Uh, but it's not too heavy-handed. You don't have to sit through a, you know, the Communist Manifesto treatise to understand this story. It's mostly an adventure story. Uh, and at its core, Treasure of the Sierra Madre is a riveting adventure tale uh, about a quest for plunder in the Mexican wilderness. I would give it probably four four hits out of five um, for, for what it is. Uh, if I were to, if somebody were to ask me, is it a crime fiction novel? Would you, how would you rate it as a crime fiction novel? I would, it would be more like a three, five, cause I don't think it really classifies, but hard boiled little noir, a lot of adventure and some good social commentary. Um, I give it a four. So that, that's a bit long winded. Well, that's okay, Justin, because it's, it's an important book with a lot of elements, I think. Well, it's interesting to hear your rating because um, I think for me, one thing with this author is it's almost impossible for me to not be biased uh, in my assessment. However, if I were to try to be unbiased in my rating, um, I think I think I would have to agree with you. I think it's a four, a, a pretty solid four out of five for me uh, in, you know, this is a 4.5 just because I, I like the author. It's hard to take this book out of the context of the film existing. I think what's interesting when we, you read this or when we see the film is 
this, you know, the film with Humphrey Bogart was so influential that there's a lot of scenes from this book that we have seen recreated in other bits of fiction or movie or whatever. So we've been exposed to it without having, if you've never read this book before. Yeah. Um, and part of that is, it's not that it's necessarily original in this. It's just a universal tale of, of, of the, the impacts of, of greed, the pursuit of wealth, and the unintended consequences of, of, of those actions. So, um, yeah, so I think this is, it's really a great book. You know, I asked you earlier if it was a noir book or not, and I do, I like your, your answer. Um, but I think after, you know, listening to your assessment of the book, I think what's interesting about this is it's not really that classifiable. Um, a lot of times it's, it's, said to be an adventure book. Well, yes, but there's a lot of different things going on. I, I do, like you say, that campfire scene towards the end, it's very noir. Um, a lot of the elements here that uh, are traditionally part of the noir experience, such as it, it is a pessimistic tale. Um, a lot of our characters are morally questionable. It's a story about greed, a little bit about jealousy, um, there's certainly an element of alienation to it. The, and those I'm sort of paraphrasing from uh, Otto Penzler's um, rather lengthy description of what noir is. But there's elements of that there. And there's certainly elements of, of hard-boiled, as you rightly point out. Um, so I think, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to get it on this podcast is because even if it doesn't fit neatly into that uh, hard-boiled crime noir fiction, it's certainly interesting for readers of of those of that genre. Like, I think you're going to find a lot in here um, if you haven't read this book that you would like, or it might be worth revisiting um, and looking for those particular elements. You know, I wanted to clarify one thing that you said, and I do think the historic context is important here. Um, the original publication date in because it was originally published in German. Mm -hmm. is 1920, 1927. Yes. Did, it definitely like predates uh, the depression, but I think it, this is really a post-World War I novel. Yeah. That's what it's, it's really getting at. And some of our, even though it's not really expressed, like Howard obviously is, is too old to be in the war, uh, but Dobbs served in World War I and that definitely comes through in at least part of his like how, how he thinks about people and also the, the boom and bust of, of the oil industry in Mexico. Part of it is that post-war uh, there's a, a bust in oil because there just isn't the demand that there was uh, during, during the war. It gets published in English for the first time in 1935. And I had the kind of the luxury, I guess, and I really enjoyed this when I went to our college library and I was looking for a copy of this book I went to check it out and I found out, oh, this is a first edition 1935. I mean, it's got a library cover and stuff on it, so it's not like super, you know, mint or anything. But I love the idea that this has been sitting in the University of Washington's library since it, since then. And it's been checked out and like, I love the story of, you know, who might have read this here yeah. at this university who made, you know, there's oddly for a university book, there's almost zero notes in the part in the margins, mm -hmm. but there, you know, there's just little things. And, and I wonder, you know, I just, the history of this book makes, makes it interesting to me also because Traven's work has sort of had these moments of like, it was very popular before world war II. Um, it had a little bit of popularity after world war II. And then it sort of disappeared for a decade or so. And then in the 60s and 70s, there's a resurgence of interest. It falls out of favor again in the 80s into the 90s. And then, I don't know, I would say about, maybe it was about 10, 15 years ago that there was another little, a very small uh, boom in interest in, in this work. But I think one of the reasons why it's so interesting is these universal themes. Yeah. And I think that uh, Trayvon is a writer that like people are going to come back to. It, it's almost as if uh, this book's popularity follows the same boom and bust cycles that it documents. The sort of rise in questioning, mm. you know, social motives yeah. of greed and, and capital and whatnot. And, and when, when we're not willing to deal with those serious questions closely, we don't want to read his work. And and, and that there, therefore we'll be uh, re-exploring and revisiting Traven for the next few hundred years. <laughs> That's a good point. And and like, like you said, like unlike a lot of books in this I mean, because it is a political novel, let, let's be 
I think, honest about that. But it's like you said, it's not one that it doesn't hit you over the head with anything. No. It says a few things here and there, but it, it's really left in the eyes of the, the reader uh, to take take up what what you want from the narrative, um, even though there is it is kind of guiding you somewhere. Um, but it's still it's 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 letting the reader make those those choices for themselves. So, Justin, would you like to do you want to talk about characters here setting? I know that you at one point you had brought up a, a, the original review of this book, which I, I found humorous. I don't know if you want to explore that. at oh, all. Oh, yeah, I got to find it. I have it written down somewhere. Let me let me dig that up. But at, while I dig that up of the of the four of the three major characters plus plus our fourth character is there one that you that really stood out to you that you appreciated um in terms of how they were developed or what they offered you know what they brought to the story is there somebody that you you've read this book three times now so who who sticks to you more i mean i think howard is really to me the most interesting character and the reason being is that both Curtin and Dobbs are essentially new to this experience of, of searching for gold. And Howard is certainly is not. He has spent his life in the pursuit of this, but yet he, even though he's done that, like he pretty much knows he's not going to succeed, right? Because yeah. even in the past when he has succeeded, he's just spent the money going after the pursuit again. And that's why I think he's a flawed, you know, like he's an interesting character, but he's also a flawed character because despite him being pretty sensible about the, the goings on, like what to do, how to handle the situation, his knowledge, all of that. Like if he was really smart about it, he would have found something else to do with his life. That's true. (laughs) Other than (laughs) to go out there and, you know, he pretty much told everybody from the get go, hey, we're going to turn on each other and that we're probably never going to get this money, but let's go do it anyway. Yeah, which which is itself sort of a commentary uh, of, you know, we we heed the lessons of history uh, or, or we fail to. Uh, and yeah. he's certainly one who who knows exactly what's to come, uh, but he he gets into the boat anyways and gets eaten by the shark. He, he knows it's out there, uh, but he can't help himself. And what does that say about human nature or about this particular economic moment? I mean, there are a fair number of characters in the book, especially when you add in the story within a story elements. Yeah. Um, but, you know, those are more, I don't know, would you call them a parable? Yeah. I mean, none of those characters are stand out. They're, they're just, they're set pieces. They're, they're just tropes filling, filling roles for the sake of the, the parable or the morality tra- tale. Really, we and, and even um, Lechard, or I always I want to rhyme it with Picard. Look, mm, mm-hmm. I think he's supposed to have a university background, so like he's more of a technical analyst, um, but he's still got the gold bug. But he doesn't really do a whole lot. No, I think he's really brought in to 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 poke the hornet's nest. I think. I mean, yeah, from a writerly yeah. perspective, uh, you know. How, do, how does Travin stir shit up? He brings that fourth element in. He's a little bit vague. He's a little bit fishy. And he, he gets he gets all of them reeling, um, you know, yeah, psychologically. And that's good for us as readers. But yeah, he does. we don't actually see him use any of his expertise. He like walks around the mountain and does his thing and then comes back at the end of the day. And we, we really only see him by the fire uh, for the most part. Yeah, so we, we really, we basically have three characters that yeah. have, you know, any kind of development. And, um, you know, I don't know that, I mean, Curtin and Dobbs are, they're not exactly like teenage boys, but they're like, what, supposed to be in their early 20s, I would say. I presume, I I can't stop thinking about, I just picture Humphrey Bogart all the time, but (laughs) who always played these younger guys, but he always looked like he was 52. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, I mean, I guess this is supposed to be the, you know, maybe 1920, 1921-ish yeah, uh, that these events are happening. So, World War One ends in 1918. Dobbs is, you know, presumably 18, 19 years old there. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so early 20s, but they don't really change that much through the course of the book. They kind of like Curtin has to kind of question his, like he has moments where I mean he's set up to be the sort of better guy. He's not a like great guy but he's better than Dobbs and he has to sort of quite struggle with 
am I going to stay that way or am I going to let the situation corrupt me? And he sort of teeters on the brink a couple of times. Um, Dobbs is portrayed as being more blunt, as you said, uh, and more aggressive from the get go. He pretty much maintains that the question for him is, is he going to accept these guys as maybe not friends, but at least like coworkers or they use the term partners uh, a lot in this book. Is he going to give into that or not? Or is he going to try to go it alone? And as the, you mentioned in the summary, we know he ends up trying to go it alone. I mean, that's a long answer to say that I think Howard is the most interesting character. You'd have to think that Howard has been through something like this before. He's been the curtain or the Dobbs and he made it back with something. Uh, and then he decides to go out and do it again and yep. go through this. Yeah. I think that's, that's a, interesting to yeah. me. Yeah. That's a fair answer. I mean, I think Howard is maybe the moral center, maybe the heart, maybe, I mean, maybe all of it. Uh, I, I wouldn't say Hobbes. Hobbes has a certain amount of violence and vigor, but uh, he's always a little bit, he's, he's, he's selfish from the start. He, and he never really, that selfishness never really resolves itself. It's always there. And it just gets, you know, is he going to stay selfish or is he going to, is he going to become more communitarian? And, and the answer is now he stays pretty much selfish. So no, no big character arc there. Howard is always the wise old owl. He's telling stories from the get go. He tells stories at the end. Uh, he, he's a, he's a genial, helpful person. Uh, but, uh, he's definitely not dominated by this sort of vicious desire for gold in the same way that, that, that Dobbs is. And Curtin is consistent too. He's sort of like, well, he's sort of a, a nice guy, but you don't really know much about him. And that's sort of how he is all the way through. So if you're looking for big character arcs, you don't really see them here. It's almost like everything in this novel is forecast from, from page one. We know it, we know what's coming. You know there's going to be trouble on that mountain. And lo and behold, oh, that's what happens. Ju- you know, you said you mentioned that, Justin, page one. Let's even start with the introductory question. The quote at the very beginning of the book, which I, I did want to throw in here at some point. This is uh, Travin pretty much projecting the entire the entirety <laughs> of the book right here is yeah. the treasure which you think not worth taking trouble and pains to find. This one alone is the real treasure you were longing for all your life. The glittering treasure you are hunting for day and night lies buried on the other side of that hill yonder. There you go. I read that when I, you know, I started, you know, I guess, like I said, I've read this a couple of times and, and I read that this time. Wow. You know, I kind of passed over this before and I'm going to reread that quote at the end of the book. And, and he just, he really just, you know, I mean, there could be a little bit more to it, but he really just throws out what he's going to, he's going to do right before you even see the title page. Yeah. But it has more resonance after having read the book and you go, wow, like that, that's yeah. an incredible way of, uh, of dramatizing uh this situation. Uh, I did find that Kirkus review that was uh, published in 1935. Uh, this is a, a one paragraph review of the treasure of the Sierra Madre by, by Bruno Traven because uh, B Traven uh, is arguably uh, the B stands for Bruno. Uh, that's up for debate. <laughs> so this is what Kirkus uh, thought about the novel in 1935. The death ship by this author caused a sensation abroad, but was a flop here. The treasure of the Sierra Madre is less sensational, less powerful, and shows many of the same faults of structure and conclusive, unconvincing handling of details. Doubt whether the advertising as, quote, a breathless tale of primitive adventure will carry the average leader reader through dull pages in which two derelicts and an ex-prospector convert themselves into treasure hunters. What a chip on his shoulder against humanity the man seems to have. What unpleasant scenes and characters he portrays. If intended as a plea for the underdog, it lamentably fails as propaganda, for his underdogs deserve elimination. <laughs> so I think I think they love the book. Yeah. Yeah, I I love that review. I mean, you shared it with me before and I just I mean in in a sort of way, like it's it's that's kind of what made me think like, well, okay, that's ticking some noir boxes there. Yeah. Um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are unlovable losers. They're just losers, and we hate them. The end. Yeah. That's the book. Yeah, interesting review. And they either found the wrong reviewer or that reviewer didn't quite uh, know what they were reading just yet. But yeah, 
It, it might simply mean that, like you said, Treasure of the Sierra Madre doesn't fit neatly into a box. It cover it overlaps with with adventure, morality tale, uh, political intrigue novel, social commentary, a little bit of noir. It it, it covers a lot of ground uh, and sort of yeah. is its own thing. Yeah, it's interesting. It's got to take that reviewer had to take a swing at Death Ship, which you know I think does tend to in the reviews of of Traven's work does tend to be the best reviewed book. Interestingly, and I will say just this as a side, The Death Ship, we, we cover the life of a sailor. And I know of a lot of mariners who who do read a lot of maritime fiction, and they think that is one of the most compelling, accurate descriptions of life on a ship uh, that has ever been written. Wow. So, yeah, it's a, and it, I mean, it is very dark and deep, like, and it doesn't necessarily reflect the modern experience, but what he is able to grasp there, like that's really, it's, it's very powerful. So it's, it's a good book, you know, just to poop sort of poo poo it at the beginning of that review is uh, I don't, don't think this reviewer really has a sense of what uh, Traven is trying to do in his work. Well, it was fun to fun to look at that. You can't always trust the reviews that come out. No, they're all subjective. And, and so what, what else about this book would you like to talk about? Do you want to talk about the setting at all or these, um, these stories within a story? The setting's fine. It, wasn't, it didn't really stand out, but, it, but he did enough with that. The stories within a story, this structure sometimes rubs me the wrong way. I do like narratives inside of narratives when they reveal another aspect of the story or deepen it or, or take us in a new direction. These ones felt a little bit pedantic. I don't need to be told that bandits are bad and then have bandits come. I don't need to be necessarily told as a modern reader that you think the mining's bad. Just wait till we get on the the road back. That's even worse then. And then, and then we do that. I, I get it. And I sort of understand it sort of gives the, it sort of speaks to the universality of this struggle, how it's, it's not just these men. It's an ages old struggle that we repeat and repeat uh, ad, ad finitum. But as a reader, it's sort of sometimes I was like, you know, my eyes would glaze over reading like 15 pages of a story in a story going, how does this reflect back on the narrative? Is Travin just trying to fill the book or is this actually saying something? And afterwards, I like wipe my forehead in relief that at least it it's actually taking us somewhere in the story. Uh, it isn't totally disconnected. But then I go, well, was it necessary? And maybe as a modern reader, I'd say it's not necessary, but maybe back in the day, it, it filled a void or filled an expectation for readers. I'm not sure if that's just me or if you had a similar thought about the, the stories inside of stories. I, I guess I'm kind of in the same lines as you. I think, you know, one thing as a modern reader, you know, maybe thinking of this more in the, the terms of crime fiction or hard-boiled or noir, like it does, this, this book could have done with, uh, a bit of a more heavy editorial hand. And there's a lot of excessive information in here that could have been cut and we would have still gotten the same the same story. Where I do th- like these stories within a story, and I think like it feels a little awkward for the modern reader, but I think Traven is a European who's immigrated to Mexico who has these political beliefs that he does. He is very sympathetic to the experience that working class and indigenous Mexicans have had to endure under the exploitation of, of, well, in, you know, in capitalism or the Catholic church in Mexico or all of these different things. And I think he puts this in here for the reader's context, that Europeans, you know, his first audience and, and maybe, maybe less so, but probably also Americans need to get a little bit of that history. Mm Mm-hmm. And I do think it does serve, I mean, the bandit one is probably like the least necessary, Mm -hmm. but I think, I think putting into the, into context that, Hey, you know, this conquistadors came over here from Spain and tried to get all this material out and they didn't do it in a very uh, good way. And they exploited the hell out of people that has continues to influence how things are handled in Mexico. And it, and that's why some of these things um, are, you know, I think he, I think he does make an attempt to say like bandits become bandits because of the systematic or systemic issues that are at play in Mexico, not necessarily because they just wanted to be bandits one day. Sure. Sure. 
And it, and like I say, it feels awkward for, for as a modern reader, the way he goes about it. But my guess is it's more nuanced than a lot of things we would read in this particular time frame that would be trying to do the same thing. Which is probably separating it from pulp fiction adventure, which is just, yeah, a bunch of two dimensional villains. Uh, you don't need to know or contextualize their stories to, to root against them. But in this case, Perhaps some of these stories inside of stories give give some contextual depth to some of these situations so that we understand and, and recognize that it's not as black and white as we might have uh, you know previously thought. I agree that it is a little awkward, but I enjoyed having it in there. And I do I would say that I can't recall from Death Ship or not, but at least in the um, the jungle novels, Travin does that quite regularly. You know, in in that way, it's. I mean, it's even got some like historical fiction elements to it too. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that challenged me when I was reading um, Government, uh, one of the jungle novels. It's that we would get a little bit of narrative, and then we'd get we'd get a history lesson. And and if I'm just trying to read a story, I just want the story. I like I like context, but I don't want it's about length or, or depth or quality of the context. I, I I don't mind a page, but I don't need twelve pages of background because then I'm drawn out of the story uh, but that's that's me and that's in, in the 21st century so I um, I think it might be a product of its time but he was also doing making the effort he, he didn't want to just rest on his laurels and, and make money off a story he wanted to educate people he wanted people to see what the world was like I have nothing really to back this up other than a gut feeling but I am positive that uh, Travin is doing more work on this to getting that nuance than probably 95% of writers in the time, same time frame um, who would be writing a similar book. And I'm sure that comes from his, you know, supposed political background, assuming well, he is who most, most people think he is. I, th- I think we're, we're doing it already, but we might as well uh, shine the spotlight on B. Travin himself at this point. We, yeah. He, he's a man of mystery and, and there are a lot of rumors and hypotheses as to his origins. And I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts on this and, and I have some thoughts as well. Well, sure. Let, that's true, Justin. Let's touch on that because I think if we want to talk about this a, a as a mystery uh, novel, the, our big mystery is our novelist, right? Yeah. right? There's a pretty good track record at this point of, of documenting who this author actually was, but some of the things it's not 100% proven, you know, this particular individual story. And mm-hmm. I love that. Like, I love that we have this mysterious author who... Maybe it was this one guy, probably was this other guy, and, and I just love that. And I just want to start with, you know, this is from, um, there was, there's also been a couple of periods where this has been kind of a hot topic of research. In the 70s in particular, there was kind of a mini, like, search for who is B. B. Travin. So on my shelf, I was going to read all these at one point, but I never, I have not actually gotten around to doing anything other than sort of peruse through them. But I have... The Secret of the Sierra Madre, The Man Who Was B. Travin by Will Wyatt, The Mystery of B. Travin by Judy Stone. There's My Search for B. Travin by Jonah uh, Raskin. Jesus. And then there's Anonymity and Death, The Fiction of B. Travin by Donald O. Uh, Kankin. There's a whole cottage industry dedicated to identifying this <laughs> an invisible author's origin. If only Travin knew, he would be he could be rich. Well, I think he would have loved it, right? So the best example of this, I think, is when they were filming the Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Yes. And they had the Hollywood budget and Humphrey Bogart is there and everything. So they worked through Travin's agent to, to get the licensing, to do the film. And, you know, this is all, of course, in the days of handwritten or typed letters going through the mail. And, and Travin says, well, I'm going to send a consultant. I'm going to set my agent to you while you're filming this to work as a consultant. And Hollywood agrees. Hal Croves. Yes, yes. Hal Croves is going to come on up to, to make the trip to Hollywood and or wherever they were. I assume they were filming this in California. Um, and, and you know, give you some notes uh, while, while you're doing this. And, you know, I have to say that according to what I read, like he didn't really fool anybody even in the time. Uh, they pretty much knew that this Hal Crove's guy was probably B. Travin, but we don't know that. Yeah. So Hal, Hal Crove shows up on the set and, you know, 
says, well, no, no, no. B. Traven would, would have wanted to do this or he meant that or, you, sh you know, whatever. And he provides this consulting service to this movie, never admitting that he himself uh, was probably B. Traven. And, and one of the things that was uncovered during one of these searches, <laughs> it's difficult to pick a name. Let's just stick with Traven. Traven basically, the author who is Traven, basically believed that an artist should just stand by their body of work. That was all that was important. So he didn't want any personal information necessarily associated with who this was as a writer. He just wanted the work to stand there as B. Traven. Let's just take a step back and know that all of this is not proven, but the best material is that Traven was probably a person who was, who was born under the name Herman Albert Otto Maximilian Fieg. And he was born in, at the time, um, it would have been part of um, Germany, but it, it now be part of Poland in 1882. He shows up then in in Germany as Rhett Moret, uh, who is a German stage actor. And this has been traced. There is a picture uh, available online of him in sort of like a, looks like a, a clown costume almost. <laughs> um, but he's an actor. He's an anarchist. He's editing an anarchist newspaper in Germany called the brick burner. And all of this, you know, basically gets him into trouble. And, and again, a lot of this isn't well documented, but supposedly he's, he's arrested. He's going to be a, a killed for his political activity and he escapes. And then there's this period where we don't really know a whole lot of what happens. Um, we don't really know a much about how he ends up in Mexico, but that's where he, he shows up. And then the most common names that he, he comes up under is Beric Traven Torsven and Hal Croves. Mm -hmm. um, but I just want to list from the back of the Sierra of the treasure or the secret of the Sierra Madre. There are 20 some names of which Traven was known under in different variants uh, there is a list of things who, of people who Traven was said to be, including Jack London, uh, yes. the Mexican president, uh, Elias Calais, C Captain Bilbo, whoever that was, uh, a group of writers in Honduras, a group of leftist Hollywood scriptwriters, another Mex two d possible Mexican presidents, the president's sister, uh, a leper, a black American ex-slave, and an American millionaire. These are all possible identities of, of B. Traven. I said, I love it. It's great. It, I mean, it, what an enduring legacy. Yeah, it, it is great. And like, we don't, you know, even in this, like, it's pretty true. It's pretty well accepted that he was this, this German individual. But for a while, they weren't even sure what nationality he was. Uh, it could have been English, American, Swedish, Norwegian, Lithuanian, German, Mexican, and, and others. Because one of the things that he did is he claimed, even though the books were published in German first um, and then translated into English, he would often claim that, no, he was an American and that the English was the original version of the book. And then it had been just accepted and published in German first. And then they uh, changed it when it was finally accepted for publication in the United States. But even in the time, that was another thing that wasn't really well believed. It is interesting to me that a lot of the German, early German editions do not exist because Traven's work was one of the blacklisted books uh, when the Nazis came uh, to power. Oh, Nazi book uh, burning? And, yep. Jesus. Yes, it was considered scandalous literature. Ugh. Another claim from the back of this, The Secret of the Sierra Madre book, is the various occupations um, that Traven had over his life. And this, this list is writer, actor, photographer, theatrical agent, merchant seaman, explorer, fruit farmer, and soldier. Well, obviously he was a writer. They have traced this thing back that uh, Traven was an actor at one point. I believe from the death ship that he had to have worked as a merchant seaman at some point. It's yeah. just too, it's too accurate. Yeah. On the cover of the book, The Mystery of B. Traven, is a fame, one of the more famous pictures, supposedly, of Traven, where he's wearing one of those, what is that um, English, like, African, is that a pith helmet? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's wearing one of those. So even if he wasn't an explorer, um, he certainly took a picture uh, with, yeah. with looking like an explorer. Definitely a colorful life. 
Sure. And, and, and of course, these are all just hypotheses. Some of them are strongly suggested, you know, based on the evidence. But there's another hypothesis that he's a fraud and that he, he's a guy that, that met the um, Rhett Marut, uh, German anarchist in Mexico, and he was told these stories and he stole the stories and turned them into narratives. And that, you know, there's this also con- this complication about him using all these common American expressions but the, the, the people he is purported to be have ne- never actually went to the United States. So how would he have such a familiarity with, with sort of the, the idioms uh, uh, of the American dialect? But then he also was very skilled at writing comprehensible German idioms, too. So how, how does it all connect? And, and it really just depends on what evidence you're willing to believe. Uh, but it's engaging. I mean, there's, you could, hey, Kurt, there might be a book in you. Once you read those four that you have, you can <laughs> turn out your fifth idea. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think the popularity is quite there anymore. But um, I think that's an interesting point, though, that you make. Like, where did all this Americanism essentially come from uh, in the book? And I think a lot of that, I've, I've seen that same argument, but I think a lot of it depends on what did he do in this period from when he supposedly, if it's the same character, what did he do during this period from when he escaped to Germany to when he reemerges in Mexico, because if he was, if he was, as I sort of suspect, working as a, a merchant seaman at least for a while, um, he cer- certainly would have been exp- exposed to more more global language. He could have worked on an American ship, visited American ports, you know, all those sorts of things. I think it's probably safe to say that this individual, at the very least, was probably gifted with knowing a number of languages. I think that's that's probably accurate. Yeah, that's probably a fair assumption to make. I think it's a little weird, though, Justin, to say that the stories were stolen because it might that might be like easy to do with one novel or two. But, yeah. you know, Tra- Travin is, is credited with doing 12 novels, a, a nonfiction piece, and then writing short stories. So that's a lot of material to steal from somebody else. Well, yeah, I mean, it would be more like idea theft. But, yeah, how, you, don't, you don't turn out a... a tail over a beer into a 350 page novel without a little bit of yourself (laughs) added to it. So, so yeah, I think that that's not, that's not a very plausible or realistic theory to, to, you know, maybe in one instance, but not, not over the course of an entire career. You're right. No matter what, like, I just love, I love the story. I love the mystery. I love the fact that we'll, we'll never really solve this. I, unless there's a, a journal or he, you know, something comes up that he lays it out some very compelling evidence that probably doesn't exist anymore. If it ever did, I I love that fact. And I think it's incredibly interesting given the the types of books that Travin wrote. I mean, we didn't even, we didn't even really talk about, you know, some of these other, other ones, but he has uh, a book called the cotton pickers also called uh, the wobbly, um, there's the white rose, the bridge in the jungle, um, some that haven't even, you know, that were written, uh, published in German, but haven't been translated yet. That's something somebody could do. Also too, there's been a number, I mean, other than we've talked all about the treasure of Sierra Madre, but there's been other adaptations of this particular novel. There's also been other adaptations of, uh, of Travin's work. So for, there's been 14 different ad- adaptations uh, of Travin's work, either on TV or film, you know, it's, it's influenced, uh, a lot of modern storytelling. And like I said, I think with the power of the, the film, the treasure of the Sierra Madre, there's a lot of tropes that come originally from this novel in that movie that are part of our modern storytelling. And, you know, maybe it predates this book, but that's where I would trace some of these ideas to. Yeah, no, I think that's fair to say. I have, one last quote I want to share from, from Travin that I, that I just came across. This is a quote he, he stated when, when masquerading as Hal Krobe. So was it him or not? Let's just assume that it was. He wrote that <laughs> li- life is worth more than any book one can write. And I think if there's a take-home message from him, sure, there's the quality of his writing, the politics of his writing, the, the, the depth and, and intellectual curiosity. But he wasn't a man that made writing or the writer more important than life itself. He didn't care. He was one who wanted to embrace the world uh, and, and to, uh, you know, be of the world and of the people of the world and not shine a spotlight on himself and his own 
uh, you know, creative achievements. And, I, and, you know, that that sounds a lot like the kind of Travin that I imagine him to be as a human being. Yeah, yeah, sure does. I know that this is a guy you could probably talk a lot about. Maybe we'll come back and uh, talk about the Death Ship one day. But any any last thoughts about Travin and, and the Sierra Madre? I mean, given that we're going to come back to it in our next episode uh, to talk about the movie. I think I want to close with, you know, one of the things that, I, that fascinates me about this time period uh, with crime fiction, with hard-boiled and noir fiction, is that, and, and perhaps the thing that I am most drawn to is that it's also very proletariat fiction. Indeed. And this book is very much that. I, I love the writing that's being done here because we're starting to see, you know, you have the, um, the emergence of a couple of different things going on that are the same things that drive pulp fiction, the same things that drive crime fiction. You have broader audience of people who have had the education to be able to read a novel. Uh, you have publishing that has reduced the price of books being more accessible to the public. And you have, you know, there's a market for people who want to read things that are about experiences that, you know, they can kind of see themselves in. And ultimately this is a book about working your ass off and not necessarily getting the rewards that you hope. And for that, like that's such a universal theme. And that's why I find this fiction so interesting. Yeah. And that's why I'm ultimately drawn to crime fiction is even though it's these characters, I mean, I'm not going to go rob a bank, but I understand you aren't, you can understand the motivations for wanting to try to try, try to get ahead. And I love that. As we'll see in our, in our next uh, feature, Elmore, Elmore Leonard's swag, it's the same situation, the same type of characters. This is, these are, these are proletariat stories about people who are desperate, looking for ways to, to make it big or at least be comfortable and finding that it's, that road is, is paved with, with roadblocks and dangers. And even if you do succeed, like, like they supposedly did in Sierra Madre, there are future uh, concerns that you might not have foreseen that, that get in the way and prevent you from, from your dream being fulfilled. And if that isn't the story of capitalism in a nutshell for a lot of working class people, I don't know what is. And the, the, I agree with you fully, Kurt, that the best crime fiction for me is that fiction that comes from the streets and that tells the story of regular people struggling against uh, you know, structures that oppress them. You know, if you haven't read Traven, pick up one of his books. Probably, maybe don't start with the Jungle novels, but either The Death Ship or Treasure of the Sierra Madre are, are good choices and I think you'll find something you like. So in upcoming episodes, Justin, next we're going to do next episode is going to be a, a shorter episode. Um, we're going to both after we've recorded this, we've read the book, we're going to go watch or rewatch uh, the treasure of the Sierra Madre with Humphrey Bogart, the classic film. And then w- mostly in our next episode, we're going to talk about some of the differences between the film and the book in a sort of which, what medium did what better and kind of get into a little, little comparison there. Uh, after that, we're going to do, we've decided on covering swag from Elmore Leonard. And then we'll be, I believe after that, we're doing Pimp, which is more of a bi- autobiography by uh, Iceberg Slim. That's it. That'll, that'll clean out the, the, the 60s for us. And after that, we're, we're entering into the realm of 70 episodes. And that's a, we're going to probably take a pause there and collect our heads. But I'm excited about this lineup. And, uh, and I look forward to hearing from you all out there what you think about our, our choice regarding Elmore Leonard. Because I know that a lot of you had a, had a say on that uh, via Twitter and, and Facebook. So uh, in terms of contacting us, you can reach out to us at our, at our website, pointblankpodcast.com. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. We have a, we have a group and, and, a, and a Facebook page, Point Blank Hard Boiled Noir and Detective Fiction. We do have a Twitter page. Uh, I still manage it, uh, Point Blank Noir. Uh, Gmail, you can reach out to us at Point Blank Noir at Gmail. We also have a Point Blake uh, Patreon. If you want to throw a, a couple bucks at us, we'll, we'll take it. So um, spread the word. If you like the show, give us a rating on iTunes. It always helps us in some strange, intangible way. And uh, also tell your friends, fellow uh, sister crime writing enthusiasts. Uh, let them know that, uh, that we're out here doing this. Uh, if you happen to be in the Albuquerque area in, in uh, early October, I am hosting a noir at the bar at a uh, brewery here in Albuquerque. You can find out information about that event 
uh, on Facebook if, if you're interested. And for the hell of it, I'm going to promote a, a journal I just started called Nihilist Poet Militia. It's a literary journal where I'm, I'm seeking submissions of, of very short poetry and very short flash fiction. It can be about it could be crime fiction. It could be literary. Uh, the key is that it, uh, you know, it's sort of well, you can read it. You can read the guidelines on your own. If you go to Nihilist Poet Militia, you can find it on Facebook or you can find it uh, again promoted on, on the, our Facebook point blank page. But if you're a, if you're a writer, you know, I'll pay you five dollars if I publish your work which ain't much, but it's better than most journals. All right. Well, that sounds good. So that's that. I guess. I mean, Justin, I, I, I think I see gold uh, on the other side of that hill yonder. Do you want to head off with there and see if we can find it? I, I'm sure that if we pursue that gold, n- nothing bad will happen. I feel confident. Certainly not. <laughs> Let's get our burrows and go. <laughs> and this was our final podcast episode. They were never seen again. <laughs> See you guys. Bye, folks. Point Blank is under a Creative Commons license. Music is by Justin. Copywritten works are property of their respective holders.